Hello, a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's programme, Egypt's former president is buried in Cairo a day after he collapsed in court and died shortly after. Riot groups are now calling for a probe, while the country's state media says Mohammed Mursi's death was due to a heart attack. Trump Heights. Israel inaugurates a new settlement in the Golan Heights, a contested territory. The project is named after the US president in a gesture of appreciation for his recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the area. Also coming up, the last episode of award-winning animation series Flavors of Iraq. This week, Farhat Alani takes a look back at Iraq 20 years after his first trip. The cycles of warfare, sectarianism and the rise of extremism. Thank you for watching Middle East Matters. Now, we start in Egypt this week, where the country's former president, Mohamed Morsi, has been buried hours after he collapsed in court and died. Calls continue for a probe into whether he had received adequate medical care in prison. Here's uh, Laurent Berstecker with a look back at Morsi's life and turbulent year at the helm. In June 2012, Mohamed Morsi became Egypt's first democratically elected president. A U.S. educated engineer, he had been a relative unknown before being chosen to represent the Muslim Brotherhood. And despite being the only candidate with an Islamist manifesto, Morsi had campaigned on a message of tolerance and inclusion, trying to portray himself as a moderate. Today, I'm the president of all Egyptians, those who live here and those who live abroad. But the fall was as sudden as the rise for Mohamed Morsi, who soon began to display authoritarian tendencies. Months after his election, he issued a decree granting himself sweeping new powers and immunity from the courts before pushing through a new Islamist constitution. These decisions proved unpopular with many Egyptians and sparked mass street protests in which dozens of people were killed by June 2013, millions were in the streets to demand Morsi's departure. And in July, the army took things into its own hands, forcibly removing the president. The coup ended in a bloodbath, with the military, led by current president General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, violently repressing Morsi supporters in a crackdown that left nearly a thousand people dead. Morsi was arrested, and later charged with inciting murder and torture, spying for foreign governments, and plotting terrorist acts. He died aged 67, still in detention, after fainting during a court session. In other regional news, the U.S. says that it's deploying a thousand more troops to the Middle East. The latest escalation comes following an announcement by Iran that it would scale back compliance with the 2015 nuclear accord. This a year after Washington violated that agreement and proceeded to impose sanctions on Tehran. Adding to mounting tensions, accusations that Iran attacked two commercial tankers in the Gulf of Oman, which the Islamic Republic denies. Now, according to experts, it will take weeks to investigate all of these competing claims. Over to Istanbul, where two mayoral candidates argued over a contested election in March, as well as their policies in a televised debate. The AK Party candidate, that's Ben Ali Yildirim, will face off the opposition's Ekrem Imamoglu on June 23rd in a vote that will be vital for the ruling party. Here's a report from our team on the ground. A rare event in a country where campaigns more often boil down to threats and accusations. For the first time in 17 years, a ruling party candidate held a televised debate with his opposition rival, five weeks after the controversial decision to cancel Ekrem Imamoglu's victory to become Istanbul's next mayor. Votes were stolen in this election. Votes for me went to the CHP candidate or other candidates. That is theft. The Election Commission never mentioned stolen votes in its report. But on public squares and in front of mosques, people are talking about theft. But who stole them? 
Despite their disagreements, the tone was mostly cordial as they sat around a table in an empty conference center. But millions of Turks were watching, especially in Istanbul, where many gathered around giant screens set up around the city. Debates like this one should take place in a functional democracy. I don't know if it'll change the minds of undecided voters, but it might dent the traditional divide between the CHP and the AKP. With election day fast approaching, the opposition CHP party has dispatched volunteers to convince undecided voters. I'm here to try to reach out to people in some way or another. This is more than a simple election. It's a question of legality and of justice. So we're doing everything to win a second time and with an even greater margin. Voters and onlookers alike will be watching to see if the democratic process is upheld this time around. Mustafa heads a non-partisan NGO that will dispatch more than 10,000 volunteer observers to voting booths on Sunday. The election system is quite healthy as long as there is no pressure on the institutions. At the end of the day, democracy is an ideal. And um, if people don't claim it, if they don't work for it, uh, it will deteriorate anywhere in the world. In the streets of Istanbul, President Erdogan is no longer front and center on the ruling party's campaign posters. Instead, his candidate, Benali Yildirim, is shown with new proposals that were absent in March. A change of strategy the AKP hopes will allow it to hold on to the city that until now has remained firmly in its grasp. Next to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who inaugurated a new settlement in the Golan Heights, named after the country's, and I quote, great friend, that's U.S. President Donald Trump. The move comes despite much opposition from the international community, given that control over the territory has been contested since Israel captured the area from Syria in 1967. France 24's Thomas Waterhouse brings us up to speed. The Trump name is usually emblazoned on shiny Manhattan skyscrapers. But now, the US president's patronymic is splashed proudly in the Golan Heights. Israel has honored Trump by naming a planned settlement after him on this lofty but long fought over land. President Trump is a great friend of our states, a leader who has done things which were not done previously and should have been done by the power of justice and truth. On March the 25th, Trump broke ranks with the international community by declaring that Washington recognizes that the Golan Heights are part of Israel. Two of the three wars between Israel and Syria have been fought over this 1,800 square kilometer strategic and fertile ground, which is also bordered by Lebanon, Jordan and the Sea of Galilee. Tensions brewed for years over the Golan Heights' important water resources before the Six-Day War in 1967 saw Israel capture the area from Syria. Israeli settlers then wasted no time in building a home here. In 1973, another war saw Damascus fail to retake control before both sides agreed to an armistice a year later. UN peacekeepers have patrolled the so-called Purple Zone ever since. But in 1981, Israel annexed two-thirds of the heights in a move not recognized by the international community. Syria still wants the land back, but negotiations with Israel, which began in the 1990s, came to a stop when Syria's civil war broke out. That conflict has seen many battles rage between Assad's forces and opposition and jihadist fighters in the east of the heights. Landmines are still peppered across the plateau, meaning that the turning of this tiny hamlet into a wider settlement bearing the US president's name could prove difficult. It's time now for the final episode of Flavors of Iraq, a 20-part award-winning animation series that we've been running here on Middle East Matters. Since the American army left, Iraq has suffered more. Militias in the Islamic State group have killed thousands, and thousands more have been forced to leave their homes. 
Some of my family are still there, often because they didn't have the option to leave. My uncle Ayad, who'd brightened up my first night in Fallujah, hasn't left. Like a lot of Iraqis, the war made him harder. Now he's grumpy and antisocial. He cut himself off from a lot of his friends and family, and I haven't heard from him recently. My cousin with green eyes, Ziad, stayed in Baghdad. He's a security guard for an oil refinery and risks his life every day. Refineries are often the target of attacks. Other members of my family are among the four million Iraqis who fled the country. Those who left needed money for the trip. Exile isn't an option for everyone. My aunt Sumeya, who came to visit us when I was a child, couldn't put up with the explosions anymore. She moved in 2006 during the militia war and now lives in neighboring Jordan. My cousin Odai also lives in Jordan. He's passed on his love of the French football team to his two sons who have never seen Iraq. Odai hasn't returned once since leaving. But there's no work in Jordan and no prospects for refugees there. Odai dreams of going to America. My cousin Omar, who once collected girlfriends, was able to move to Canada, another country of refuge for thousands of Iraqis. He has two children with a Canadian Iraqi woman. My cousin Mazen, who tried his best for his patients in Baghdad despite drug shortages, never gave up on his calling. He's now practicing in the U.S. and is studying to become a heart surgeon. My parents live in Nanterre, a suburb of Paris. And my little sister has moved to London. She's started a family with a British Iraqi man. As for me, I live in Dubai now, but keep a watchful eye on my two countries, that of my parents, which became mine, Iraq, and my birth country, France. My name is Furat Alani, and I am Iraqi and French. Now you can watch uh, Flavors of Iraq on our website. That's France24.com. Thank you for watching.